Hello. Hello and welcome to the Couch Lesson number four. My name is Jeanette and I'm working for the Goethe Institute in Munich. I'm very happy that so many people from all over the world are joining us today. I hope you have made yourself quite comfortable, maybe on a couch, maybe with a cold drink in your hand, and that you will spend a pleasant hour with us. Hopefully you also enjoyed the music. It was the song Daddy's Car from the startup Flow Machines, a song in the style of the Beatles. And except for the singing, it was completely composed by an artificial intelligence. So can AI be creative? This is just one question we are dealing with during our couch lessons. Every week, always on Wednesday, we invite experts from all over the world to discuss the risks, the challenges, but also the opportunities presented by the developments in the field of AI. The Couch Lessons are funded by the Federal Foreign Office and organized by the Goethe Institute, the worldwide active cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We promote the study of the German language abroad and we also want to encourage an international cultural exchange. With the Couch Lessons, we want to initiate a discussions outside the technology savvy community and we deal with AI because AI has and it will have a huge impact on our society at different levels and in various fields. AI will contribute to a new revolution in human history. And this fact raises a lot of questions. How intelligent can machine become? Um, are we threatened by the automation of society through algorithms and AI? Will initially human skills such as the creation of art be computerized? Or will AI make the world a better place by helping us solve big problems such as climate change, pandemics or inequalities? Do we still have to work in the future? And if not, what else will we do? As AI shapes our society for better or worse, it should be on all of us to decide what direction we will take. The couch lists are an invitation, an invitation to find meaning behind the technology developments in the field of AI, to inspire new ways of thinking and create our collective future. Today, we will ask if and how AI can be a powerful tool in fighting climate change. This huge problem our planet is facing will need every solution possible, maybe also a technology like artificial intelligence. Do you believe that AI can help tackle the climate crisis? Please take part in our poll. And as long as we wait for your answers, I would like to inform you briefly about some guidelines of our couch lessons. First, the invited experts will give an input, each about 10 minutes long. And after that, we will open the discussion. I assume that it will take 40 to 45 minutes until we can discuss with you. Therefore, we want to extend the lesson maybe uh, until 6.15 p.m. And I hope that is okay for you. You can always ask questions or contribute your opinions in our chat and I will go through the chat and pick out some of the most interesting questions and then we can discuss them later. And I will ask different persons to contribute their questions or thoughts personally. But if I don't ask you to talk, please turn off your microphone. I also want you to know that the entire event is recorded, but we will just record the persons that are speaking. You can always turn off your video, although we would invite you to turn it on because so we can see all the participants from all over the world. And for that, we would recommend to use the gallery view. So let's have a look on the results of our poll. So interesting, most of you said that AI can just support people's efforts and that is not alone as the, the yeah, the silver bullet to, to uh, fight against climate change. And I hope we will hear more about it from our experts. And now I want to hand over to Martin who will moderate the lesson and who have me curating it. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry now my microphone is on. So hello everybody. My name is uh, Martin Tunkvist and I'm a uh, curator and context maker based in Malmö, Sweden. 
Uh, if this is your first couch lesson, very welcome. You're in for a ride. We have a great lineup of speakers for you today. Uh, and if you participated before, you know that I have this fashion, fascination for the global nature of these gatherings. Uh, and to manifest it and acknowledge the fact that we've all deliberately made a choice to be here, uh, please say hi and type where you're joining in from in the chat. That's usually a, a really nice experience to see where you're all dialing in from. Uh, anyways, thanks a lot for showing up. It's truly amazing to have you all here. Uh, and as we've learned in previous couch lessons, AI is not a new invention. Leaps of progress has been made in the last decade or so, but it's not new at all. Uh, similarly, one of human, humanity's biggest challenges, climate change, is not a new thing neither. The impact of humans' activities on the climate has been known for a very long time. And throughout this time, technology has been put forth as part of the solution to counter it. Uh, but the climate change metrics is still on the rise and the urgency of the problem has been manifested by especially young people uh, showing up on the streets across the globe to push governments to take action and to listen to climate scientists. So here we are, it's 2020, we're in the middle of a pande pandemic, which of course is another huge challenge for humanity. Uh, and also in the past weeks, people have been gathering in the streets for other good, urgent and long overdue problems. Um, in previous lessons, we've talked about AI and COVID-19 uh, and AI and bias is scheduled for our lesson on July 8th. Um, but this couch lesson will look into how technology and AI in specific can be utilized to fight counter uh, work with climate change. And of course, it's a big topic, but rest assured, we have a great lineup of experts to unfold the topic for us. So with us we, today, we have Victor Gallas from the Stockholm Resilience Center, Lynn Kak from ETH Zurich and the Climate Change AI Group, and last but not least, Sims Witherspoon from DeepMind will be joining us. Um, we think of the lesson as a funnel, uh, and we'll start broad by defining the problem then looking into the different context AI can be used in, and then ending with two concrete cases of how AI has already been deployed in this realm. So let's get started with our first speaker. Uh, he's dialing in from Stockholm, Sweden, and his name is Victor Gallas, and he's the deputy director and associate professor at the Stockholm Resilience Center. The mission of this center is to advance research for governance and management of social ecological systems to secure ecosystem services for human well-being and resilience for long-term sustainability. And if you don't know about them, I uh, really recommend to check out Stockholm Resilience Center for their awesome work. Um, but now, please welcome Victor Gallas. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Martin, and thanks to the Goethe Institute for inviting me. <clears throat> Greetings from Stockholm. So many people from around the world. I'm very, very impressed. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you now. And, and the talk will be, I mean, I've been asked to say something uh, of the big picture, connecting AI with climate change. What can it do and what can't it do? I think in general, whenever I give these talks and when we talk about technology, uh, I would like to recognize a couple of things. First of all, being that the fact that we can live on this planet uh, is thanks to something called the biosphere. So it's the sum of all the world's ecosystems and a functioning earth system. Without that, we're nothing but a dead rock floating around on space. And of course, to that biosphere, we're now adding a very rapidly changing technosphere. All these technologies, uh, the data, algorithms are now shaping the planet in very profound ways. And the question is, of course, can we direct these, this force for something good? Can, can it help us uh, get into a state where we help stabilize the climate system? That to me is a key, key question. And I think what I wanna do, since I only have four minutes, uh, 10 minutes, I mean, is to give you four insights that I see as very important whenever we discuss the role of AI and climate change. So insight number one, I think, and this is critical. The climate challenge is much, much bigger than just about energy and emissions. I think we've seen the low hanging fruits for AI 
are in energy and emissions, but the climate challenge is bigger. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a good background, how is this change? How is the climate changing? What's going to happen in the future? Uh, this slide begins, or, or the image begins, 60 million years ago when the climate was much more warmer than today, and climate has been changing over the history of planet Earth. But what we need to recognize that we as humans have built our societies, our economies, uh, creative uses of technology during something called the mid Holocene. So that's an unusual stable state in the climate system. But what's happening now, of course, is that we're moving into a very different future. And that future is, is moving quickly towards us. Uh, and climate change is not just about temperature. It will affect everything that happens on planet Earth. It will affect agriculture. It will affect, affect biodiversity. It will affect our oceans and of course, our economies in profound, profound ways. Now, what's important to know in that regard, and, for, and when we talk about the potential for AI, and this is just one example of, of, of creative uses of AI, uh, is that actually you can use uh, satellite images and, and AI to try to increase transparency from companies. So in this particular case, this is from the UK, the Spatial Finance Initiative. What, what they are doing are developing tools that allows investors to see the emissions from companies directly without being dependent on, on corporate information. And that sounds like a small thing, but in the end, in the long term, what it can help do is to move capital. You can move capital from activities that we don't want to see on the planet to activities that, that could help us move us towards climate stability. There are many other tools that are not at all dependent on these big tech solutions or, or satellites. This is just one example from from Mexico called AgroTutor that was uh, developed by CGIR uh, that you see there in the bottom that essentially combines 500 different sources of data and variables into one tool that allows small farmers to adapt to weather and market conditions. And, and this is a, a tool that is free, that is based on open source platforms and, and free data, and that just allows small farmers to adapt to turbulence in markets and, and the climate. So. I think the potential for AI is just not for big tech and satellites, it's also the bottom-up applications of it. Number two, I think that what we need to recognize is that climate change is not something that's happening in the next 50 years or in the next 20 years. Climate change is here and it requires systems change. And AI needs to consider that. I'm just showing you this very visual uh, image of the Amazon. This was, was the Amazon fire since 2019. We're likely to see similar fires in 2020, and you'll see fires in other parts of the world or in the Arctic Circle. Uh, and this is just an indication that climate change is happening and AI needs to, could help us maybe cope with changes now. But of course, as some people have noted, we're in the midst of a slowdown due to COVID-19 and we're seeing emissions going down. <clears throat> but we need to recognize that this is temporarily so all individual adaptations that we've done now are likely to be very temporarily. So we've seen that before. This is from another article that came a couple of years ago. And then you see uh, CO2 emissions per year. And then you see the different financial crises uh, and how that affects emissions. And of course, you see a little bit of a slowdown and decrease, but then it picks up again. In the last financial crisis, 2008, 2009, if we just zoom in, there was a decrease in emissions, but you can see here how quickly it gained momentum again and actually bounced back to, to the normal trajectory. And my only point being that if you wanna solve the climate crisis, it's not just about individual changes or, or slowing down the economy, stopping people from traveling. You need to change the underlying systems of energy production, food production, et cetera. Uh, the third point is that AI is not just about opportunities for climate change, but also risks. And I think we need to be very, very explicit in that and find ways to navigate it in the future. There are many, many tools that you can use for conservation. This is just one example from one initiative by Microsoft called AI for Earth. We see a lot of in intriguing applications of AI and, and data for con conservation and the planet. But of course, there are other things that, that uh, tech giants could use data for. And in this particular case, which is quite controversial, is, is uses of, of, of computer vision or, or big data and applications to extract more oil or more coal. Um, 
another example is, of course, that as we try to get hold of more uh, minerals uh, to our technologies, we're going deeper into the oceans. And some of these heavy, heavy machinery, massive, massive machines are in machine intelligent and increasingly autonomous, thanks to AI. So how do we balance the opportunities with these risks that we see evolving quite quickly? This is just one, uh, since this has been on the agenda on the last few days uh, about facial recognition technologies, and I guess you will talk about that more in, in your next seminar. So, so IBM has decided to abandon the development of that tech. Can we think or should we think about a similar thing for applications of AI and big data uh, that are accelerating extraction of fossil fuels like coal? Can we think about a moratorium or at least some voluntary rules from big tech? Someone is, is uh, speaking and not muting. Uh, number four, and the last point, since I have just a few minutes left, I think that AI and climate change opportunities are huge. They're very, very big in theory, but very difficult to quantify, simply because AI is such a general application technology that will affect so many things in society. Uh, so this is from one report and one estimate from Microsoft uh, that was published uh, a year ago that applications of AI could increase GDP, uh, could decrease uh, emissions around the world and create more jobs. And that, of course, will depend on where you are in the world. I recommend that you take a look into that report. I think these are very, very preliminary uh, numbers. Uh, I would say it doesn't acknowledge uh, indirect effects or, or dominant effects of AI applications. But we should remain and think about it in, in an optimistic way if we want to. And on one way that I normally think about it, my colleagues uh, that work with, with urban development in the beginning of 2000 said that more than 60% of the area projected to be urban in 2030 have yet to be built. That was in the year 2000. And that they saw as a massive, massive opportunity to get it right, to use uh, design and technology in, in good ways that, that would allow these new urban cities to, to contribute uh, to, to a more stable uh, climate and planet. And of course, it's the same with these AI-based solutions and innovations that we're seeing now. We have no idea. I mean, all these things are about to create it in the near future, whether it's tech for farmers, uh, whether it's novel applications of satellite technologies, new risks assessments in the insurance sector, et cetera. We're just, just in the beginning of that revolution. So just to sum this up, I think what we're going to see now is so not just rapid climate change, but actually machine intelligence evolving and increasingly autonomous technologies. So things that become less and less dependent on human direct input. And as that happens, with great powers come great responsibilities, of course, especially in the big tech sector. There's a massive, massive influence on the planet and on people's behavior. The, this entails a lot of responsibility. And of course, this has triggered a discussion in general about responsible AI that is about transparency, accountability, et cetera. But I think we need to add a second dimension to that discussion, something that you could call planetary responsible AI. So AI that cont contributes to, to a stable climate for all in the future. That would be it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Uh, and we will get back to you at the end for the Q and A. Um, so for everybody participating, please ask uh, questions in the chat uh, and we'll make sure to incorporate them in the discussions after the talk talks. Um, but now let's go to our second speaker. Uh, her name is Lynn Kak and she's a postdoctoral researcher in the energy politics group at ETH Zurich and she's also the chair of the climate change AI group. Uh, a, a group of uh, machine learning experts uh, that last year released a paper on how machine learning can be powerful can be a powerful tool in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and we're super happy to have her here to go through some of the findings in that paper so please beam your energy to link Kak. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours thank you and thanks for inviting me um give me one second to set this up all right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a recent paper that I've been involved with um, called Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning. And um, this provides an overview of all the different ways that machine learning can come in to address climate change. And I'm going to start by giving some brief definitions of what I mean with machine learning and um, the research that's concerned with climate change. And then I will walk through the high level insights that we gained from writing this paper. So machine learning is concerned with a group of techniques that can automatically extract patterns from a large amount of data. And um, some common terms that are associated with it is um, deep learning. So those are techniques that are inspired by neural networks on the brain. Um, reinforcement learning is concerned with optimization of agents' actions in an environment. Um, then there's computer vision, um, which refers to tools that can gather insights from images and videos and natural language processing, which um, refers to understanding human language. And the term artificial intelligence is often used synonymously with machine learning, but it refers a little more to um, this idea of emulating the human intelligence. And um, a large part of what um, we mean with artificial intelligence these days is actually machine learning. Um, so climate change, um, is commonly addressed by three different um, approaches or um, research on climate change, which is um, climate science, which uh, looks at how we can um, detect, model, and forecast the variability and changes in the climate. Um, then there's adaptation, um, which is concerned with robustness and resilience to climate change effects. And the last one is mitigation, um, which is concerned with how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions to slow down climate change. And in our report, um, we have looked at all three of um, those topics. And um, we looked in detail on how machine learning can come in to help with these endeavors. And the report was written in a large collaboration um, with many machine learning researchers and people who work on climate change. And we, we wrote around 60 pages of um, different applications that people have already been working on. And, um, and we also gained some high level insights and I wanted to walk through these. So um, we call these recurring themes and um, they illustrate um, better on a high level how machine learning can come in to, to address climate change. So, um, Machine learning is really good in forecasting, and this can help, for example, with predicting extreme events um, from weather. I believe uh, somebody's unmuted, so if we could um, disable participants to unmute themselves for a sec. Um, then forecasting can be useful for um, also uh, determining carbon prices um, in the future or forecasting solar power, and I wanted to quickly um, dive into um, this last aspect, uh, which is really important for balancing supply and demand in the electricity system. And um, so machine learning can here help to provide forecast of supply and demand from um, historical data or physical model outputs or image and video data. And this is particularly important for forecasting wind and solar um, that ha have high variability in the output. And um, this then helps to schedule and plan um, in the electricity sector, and it helps to integrate more renewable energies into the grid. Um, another area that is kind of surprising and really interesting is um, the ability to accelerate experimentation and machine learning can be used to um, look through large um, data sets of potential combinations of molecules, for example, and um, pick those that are most promising. And that can help in material research, for example, to find better materials for solar PV, um, but it can also help to accelerate battery research. And um, another ability of machine learning is to um, mine data um, that is helpful for, for example, in disaster response situations or for planning, um, for informing policy and that's an area that I personally work in and I wanted to um, quickly provide some examples of, of what actually we mean with this and um, one example is to treat text as data. So um, in the policy sector there are large amounts of text data, for example legislation, um, other types of reports, 
and um, those are really hard to to analyze to be analyzed and it takes really long to manually sift through them so um, to really systematically assess policy design um, we need to be able to to analyze them at scale and here machine learning can help by using natural language processing um, to um, help computerize text analysis and um, this really helps for targeted policy making so for example um, i'm currently involved in a project where we look at climate change related um, financial disclosures and look through a number of um, a large number of annual reports of corporations to find um, statements regarding climate risk both for physical but also transition risk which are really important for making investments um, relatedly um, but the area of remote sensing uses images to provide this information and this can be of greenhouse gas emissions um, directly or it can be of deforestation or infrastructure data and um, just to quickly illustrate what this looks like um, so for um, <clears throat> for infrastructure data machine learning can use techniques such as object detection or se semantic segmentation um, to extract um, useful insights from satellite images or aerial or drone imagery. And on the left, you can see an example of um, extracting building footprints from satellite images using deep learning. Um, this is something that Microsoft has done for the entire United States. So they were able to automatically extract building footprints from satellite images. And um, such information is really helpful for um, providing inputs for um, simulations and, and for making better decisions in the policy sphere. Other examples of these techniques are, for example, um, understanding where rooftop solar PV is installed from satellite images, or um, I've done a project where we looked at if we can um, extract information about the truck traffic from satellite images. Um, then machine learning can also be used to approximate time intensive simulations. So, um, for example, to simulate the, the climate um, system, those are really computationally heavy simulations. They take a long time to run. They need a lot of resources. And, um, and what machine learning can do is can learn the outputs of these simulations and, and speed up um, the way that solutions are found. And for example, if you have energy simulations, like for example, in a building, um, and you want quick answers to um, how your input parameters might actually um, affect the outcome, you, you use these, um, these approximations of the simulations to, to then give timely answers. Instead of uh, on the scale of hours or days, um, we're talking about um, minutes or, or few hours. And this can also be used for social systems. And um, machine learning techniques are used for um, making um, systems more efficient, for example, heating and cooling systems in buildings or freight systems, or also um, food supply systems. And um, the last point is um, predictive maintenance. Um, so here machine learning can help to allocate maintenance resources more efficiently and therefore help um, low carbon um, energy infrastructure such as wind parks to be more competitive or it helps to um, reduce the leaks in natural, natural gas pipelines, and it can also help to construct more resilient infrastructures. So what we learned from this is that ML is a powerful tool, but it's really important to stress that it's not a silver bullet. And I wanted to quickly iterate over some strengths and limitations of machine learning. Um, so as we learned, um, machine learning is, is good in scaling human insights. And it's also good in optimizing complex systems, um, as well as generating new data from sources of data that previously couldn't be analyzed. And um, machine learning even has the ability to be integrated with physical models, so it can, can integrate well in existing um, ways to approach, to approach these problems. But some of um, the main limitations here are that if your data is not good and it doesn't tell you much about what you're actually interested in, um, your model will also not be good. So the principle is, is known as garbage in, garbage out. Um, the other problem is um, one might be tempted to think it's objective, but it's really not. So um, there can be biases introduced through the data or the design or the use of these models. And um, it somewhat also assumes the patterns are persistent. So if your data generating process changes, such as in long-term forecasts, 
for example, through, through a shock like um, the pandemic, um, machine learning models are, are really um, have a hard time dealing with those shocks because um, they couldn't predict them from previous data. And um, it finds correlation, not causation. So it's um, largely a statistical tool. Um, so how we view it is this, the machine learning is one piece of the puzzle. And what's really important um, to note is that machine learning um, to be really relevant, it needs to, needs to be used in collaboration with people who really understand the problem. And um, at best also from the start, from finding a problem. And for that, we have um, founded this organization called Climate Change AI um, that connects people who work on, on machine learning with people who really um, are involved with uh, climate change related problems. And um, we do that by organizing workshops at conferences, for example. Um, we have an online presence, so we have an online forum for um, people to connect. We have a newsletter and resources on our website. And um, if you're interested, I, I invite you to check out our web website. And um, the people in this organization are largely um, the authors from this paper. So we have a core group of um, young researchers um, and machine learning experts, and we have a group of senior advisors. I'm happy to talk more about what we're doing with this organization later. And with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. And uh, we're indeed looking forward to follow the, the work that you're doing and also the group, how it develops. Uh, and to everybody else, keep, uh, please keep the conversation going in the chat and, and ask your questions there. And Jeanette will point to, to some of you later who can ask, the, and then you can ask your questions yourselves. Um, but now, Last but not least, we have Sims with us. With us, uh, she's a program manager at DeepMind, the artificial intelligence company that I think has been mentioned in all previous lessons. Um, it's famous for developing the breakthrough program AlphaGo that beat the human professional Go champion Lee Sedo. Um, for us, Sims will present to cases of how DeepMind is using the te technology they're developing to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Please give it up for Sims with a spoon. Uh, the screen and the microphone is yours, Sims. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Martin. I really appreciate it. Um, all right. We are going to see if this works because we were having technical difficulties earlier. So um, can you all see my screen yes i can no Thank longer you. see you all so okay all right great um so hi everyone um my name is sims witherspoon and i have the pleasure today to speak with you about how we at deepmind think about applying ai systems to the challenges that drive climate change so um, i'll be specific uh specifically speaking today um about applications in mitigation um not adaptation which uh lynn so conveniently pointed out um right before this presentation so um, there are a myriad of areas in which um, machine learning and artificial intelligence can be applied to help climate change mitigation. Um, energy, transportation, cities, industrial processes, agriculture, carbon capture are just a few of the many options. Um, and I actually love the paper that Lynn and um, her group put together. If folks haven't read it, um, they have lots of wonderful ideas in each one of these areas as, as well as more. So I, I'll do a plus one and encourage everyone to please check out that paper if you haven't read it. Um, it was a <coughs> pleasure to read. Um, my team's current focus is on energy, um, and even within energy, there are many areas where AI can be applied. There's generation, consumption, scheduling, dispatch, fusion, the, the list really goes on. Um, today, I'll be speaking to you about the applications that we've developed in consumption and generation. On the consumption side, um, our team has looked at how ML can increase the energy efficiency of industrial systems without changing their hardware. So in other words, uh, this is you know, improvement through software alone. Um, after all, you know, we can't currently wipe out the infrastructure and just start over immediately. So we really need to work with a lot of the hardware um, infrastructure that we already have in place. 
Um, and in generation, our team has explored how AI can increase the value of wind power by increasing its predictability and therefore hopefully making this renewable source a more competitive, more competitive with traditional thermal generation. So I'll kick it off with our consumption application. When, when we started our energy projects, um, we really started to look into industrial systems um, because these systems, you know, for example, data centers, factories, commercial buildings, they account for over half of the world's energy consumption. Um, they're also massively complex and generate a lot of data, um, which from previous presentations, you'll understand that you know, th this makes them right for um, a right problem for an ML solution. If you think of even a simplified industrial system, and for any mechanical engineers in the audience, please excuse this reductive example. Um, it's for illustrative purposes only, but um, let's assume they're just 10 pieces of equipment like there, there are in this slide. You know? um, and on each piece of, piece of that equipment, you can things like chillers and pumps and cooling towers and a data center. Let's say that each piece of equipment has 10 different set points that you can adjust to to control the equipment and therefore the energy efficiency. So you can think about the set points as temperature or pressure gauges. So right now you have a grid of 10 pieces of equipment with 10 set points each. Now that's already 10 to the 10th power or 10 billion possible configurations for that simple plant. And as you can imagine with that number of permutations, it really becomes impossible for a facility manager to test every single option in order to find the most efficient one and still have enough time to do the rest of her job. So what we see happens is that a human operator really needs to focus on the select number of what they deem are the most important components to manipulate. And then these optimizations are then hard coded into the system, meaning you know, they don't adapt with the building over time. Now, unfortunately, the problem here is that with a number of configurations in the billions, essentially this means that we're only able to test about 1% um, of, of the permutations, leaving the other 99% of possible optimizations you know, largely unexplored. And if all that doesn't seem complex enough, um, add to the fact that the system itself is changing. You know, these large industrial facilities have new equipment that comes online, things break or go offline for maintenance, and you can imagine it becomes even more difficult to find optimal efficiency. So knowing that AI excels in complex data rich environments, we were determined to work with the facility managers to build a system that would help solve this optimization problems, which is why we started applying AI to Google's data centers. Um, we picked data centers because they're increasingly important type of industrial facility given the world's mounting demand for compute and Google was willing to offer us these test beds. Now, if you think about data centers, you know, they generate a lot of heat. So their cooling systems are, are absolutely massive. You know, imagine how hot, top, how hot your laptop uh, gets when you stream videos on YouTube. And, you know, then imagine if your laptop was the size of an industrial complex. I mean, that is so much heat. So given this, it's really not that surprising that energy used to cool the data centers is the biggest non-server load. And that is essentially how we landed on our first pilot. We thought, okay, what if we could reduce the amount of energy used to cool data centers while allowing them to perform as usual? Um, we believe that hopefully this would help us prove that AI could increase the energy efficiency of industrial systems. So what exactly did we do? Well, in our first iteration, every five minutes, our cloud-based AI pulled a snapshot of the data center cooling system as represented by thousands of sensors all around the data, uh, the data center. Um, this data was then cleaned and prepared to be fed into our models, which were a you know, reinforcement learning agent. Our models then predicted the future energy efficiency based on the current state of the data center and the billions of possible actions under consideration. Um, so in other words, like which combinations of set points could be adjusted and by how much. Our models then identified adjustments that would maintain the operational requirements of the system, such as the temperature and pressure requirements we had to meet, while also minimizing the future energy consumption as well as satisfying our rigorous safety constraints. These recommendations were then sent hourly to a human operator who, who reviewed and manually implemented them. Now, because this is a reinforcement learning system, you know, Lynn just pointed out, the system then learns the differences between the expected outcome of the recommendations it generated and what actually happened to the energy efficiency in the data center. You know, it was then able to adjust its understanding of the environment uh, to improve future recommendations. 
And this slide shows what happened on the typical day at a Google data center that was using our system. That middle section is an eight hour window um, in which we work with data center operators to implement the AI generated recommendations. And what you see here is that energy consumption decreased and efficiently, uh, efficiency significantly improved. Now the Delta there equates to about 40% savings, which we were really excited about. Um, but the data center operators had an additional ask for us, you know, previously the the data centers had been you know, run by these pre programmed rules and heuristics. So the data center operators could really do the rest of our of their job. But if you remember when I described the system for this for AI recommendations, we were having them implement the manual changes every hour on the hour. So understandably, they asked us, you know, hey, could we achieve these savings um, without requiring us to manually implement the recommendations every hour? And so we thought, yeah, you know, okay, sure. So at their request, um, we then built a second iteration of our system that did, didn't rely on this manual implementation, but rather passed the recommendations through safety mechanisms in both the cloud as well as the physical infrastructure, and then directly implemented the changes through the data center control system. Now, you know, safety is our number one priority. So when I say the recommendations went through safety mechanisms, I mean eight different checks. We had continuous monitoring to ensure that the AI control system didn't violate any system constraints, automatic failover to a neutral state in case the control system did violate any of those constraints, a smooth transfer during these failovers to, pre to, pre to prevent any sudden changes to the system, uh, two layer verification of the AI actions before implementation so that the recommendations pass not only system safety constraints um, in the cloud, but also the constraints at the local facility side. Uh, we also had constant communication between the cloud based AI and the physical infrastructure. So there was that we were always checking there was connectivity between cloud and the local system. Um, uncertainty estimation to ensure we not only implemented high confidence actions. We only implemented high confidence actions, rather. Um, rules and heuristics as a backup in case we did need to exit AI control mode at any point. Um, and humans were always in the loop and um, available and had the ability to supersede any AI actions uh, should they need to. Now, I realize it may sound redundant to have eight different safety mechanisms, but this was really the first time that we were, we were aware of where AI was used to autonomously control um, cooling at an industrial facility of this size. So we were really committed to getting it right. And for us, that meant safety had to be our number one priority. And you know, even with those robust safety constraints, which admittedly make the system more conservative, um, we are seeing savings of around 30%. Um, and we do expect this number to increase. Because you know what I find particularly exciting about artificial intelligence is that it has the ability to improve over time. Now, this graph, I always show this graph because this is what happened when we the, when we first launched the system to a year later. And what it shows is essentially the trailing 12 month average moving from roughly 10% energy savings when we first launched the system to 30% energy savings a year later. And you can see that the improvement really um, increased along with the amount of training data that we had. So I think it's worth noting that you know, AI can adapt to some of the changes to the environment without actually needing to reprogram the control system. And that improvement over time is exactly the type of thing that we believe is needed to improve our energy infrastructure. And you know, therein lies the potential of artificial intelligence technology. Rules and heuristics don't get better over time, uh, but AI does. So um, then shifting gears a bit, um, the er other area I would love to touch on today is um, our project in increasing the, in value, the value of renewable energy. So renewable energy, we believe, is you know, an unquestionably a key to the future and to help solving uh, for climate change. You know, with the way our energy system currently works, supply largely needs to meet demand in real time, which makes planning essential. But the problem for renewables here is that they can't be 100% reliably scheduled. You know, renewables are unpredictable. Sometimes the sun shine or shines or the wind blows, and sometimes it just doesn't. Um, unfortunately, fossil fuel plants are the opposite. They can reliably deliver specific amounts of energy at set times. Now, as you can imagine, this can make renewable energy less attractive for buyers. So we thought, you know, perhaps we could use AI to more accurately predict wind power and then leverage that predictability to make wind power more competitive on the energy markets. 
So we partnered with Google again to see if we could build a system for 700 megawatts of their wind farm portfolio that would, that would help predict and then more reliably schedule their wind power. And essentially what our model did is it took weather forecasts like those provided by the UK Met Office and paired that with historical power production information from the wind farms where the model was applied, um, as well as other data sources. Um, we then feed that data into a neural network trained to predict uh, the wind power output for every wind farm about a day or so in advance. And we then use those predictions to make commitments to the grid. Now, the day or so in advance notice is important because it takes a while to ensure that, you know, between the various energy producers, the grid will actually have enough supply to meet demand commitments, um, i.e., you know, who is going to produce how much energy and when. And when we look at our predictions versus the actual generation or what we refer to as you know, the ground truth, we were really happy to see that we were pretty accurate. Um, you can also see here the intense volatility of the wind. I mean, look at that. It goes from, 100, uh, from zero uh, megawatts to 200 megawatts in a matter of hours. And you know, we can't eliminate this variability, but AI can increase the predictability, which helps make wind power a more reliable, dependable investment for buyers on the energy grid, which is gonna be important to increasing the adoption of this type of renewable. Now, I'm really happy to um, be able to state that our model is currently outperforming all known scheduling techniques, but we are still improving and we're really excited about this achievement because we do need zero carbon energy sources like wind power to be economically attractive if we're going to compete against fossil fuels on the grid. Um, but I think what's perhaps even more exciting is the future potential of AI applications like these. You know, I, I really love the, the aspirational side of artificial intelligence because I can't help but imagine these improvements in energy efficiency or, you know, in the value of wind power and what that would mean for our environment if we were able to widely adopt systems like this. You know, now I've just spoken about DeepMind projects today, but there are actually many organizations like the ones from the speakers that we that you've already heard from today working to scale, you know, technology that can help tackle climate change. Um, and as the saying goes, it really will take a village or, you know, our global community to help solve the problem. And in fact, I think our, our current situation even shows just how important, important working together is, you know, the pandemic we're continuing to face is absolutely devastating. And for people whose lives have been affected, there really is no silver lining. But for us as a global community, and for those of us who are interested in climate change mitigation or adaptation or climate science, I believe we may find hope in the way that it's highlighted what we can actually accomplish if we act collectively. You know, climate change is another existential crisis that we face together, and it's going to take cutting edge research, but also deployment to make a difference. So we've been really excited to see the number of organizations invested in the application of AI to the many, many challenges that contribute to climate change. And we're really hopeful that our research will also help this communal effort um, and drive towards an efficient zero carbon energy future. Um, so with that, I'll just say thank you, um, not only to our partners and our peers, but to everyone who's a part of this conversation. So everyone on this call um, for helping bring this, this sort of impact to the world. Martin, I'll Pass it back to you. Thank you very much, Sims. Uh, it was good to end with, with, with some optimism and aspiration, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And thank you also to, to Lynn and Victor for, for two great presentations. Uh, I certainly gained some new frameworks through which to, to look at the opportunities and complexities in addressing climate change. Um, and now we've come to the part of the lesson where we are going to hand over to the audience for some questions. And for that, I'm going to hand over the microphone to my colleague, Jeanette, who will uh, call out uh, participants for questions. Yes, uh, I start with a question from Alistair Alexander about the power that machine le learning needs at its own. Alistair, maybe you want to unmute your mic? So maybe he has left and I go on with Samuel Kopp. He uh, wrote a really long uh, opinion into our chat. Maybe you have a question as well, Samuel. So I think you need to unmute participants. Oh. Maybe in the meantime, I, I can address that question on um, the energy consumption of 
of machine learning models. Um, if that's okay. Yes. Go yeah, forward. So, um, so yes, yeah, so th this question is about the uh, um, energy consumption of training machine learning models and uh, also of the inference of machine learning models. And um, in particular, some of the deep learning models um, use a lot of electricity. Um, and, and, and that's a that's a real problem. And in the machine learning community, there have been movements um, to address those problems. So one of the movements is green AI. Um, it's definitely worth checking out and I can post links in the chat. Um, there are also impact calculators now where you can um, estimate the, the emissions impact of training your machine learning model. And essentially, um, it really depends on the size of the of the model and on the emissions factor on the grid where the servers are installed. And um, here's just one um, word of caution. If, if, if you're talking about this problem, it's really important to know like how big are the models actually that we're talking about. So machine learning models that can be very small, they can run on your computer without any problem on your laptop, or they can be uh, huge with um, millions and billions of parameters to train. And um, so we we can, we are not really comparing um, apples and and apples here. So um, many of the applications that we talked about are actually um, fairly small models, and they can be trained on a on a laptop. Um, and there's also another dimension to machine learning, of course, um, that is also the um, ability of machine learning to increase emission intensive operations because you can you can apply it um, to address climate change, but you can also apply it to, for example, spur um, oil exploration and so on. So it's really just a tool here. And, um, and um, the mission here of writing that paper was to, to illustrate all the um, ways that machine learning can be applied to address climate change in a, in a positive way. Thank you, Lynn. So I unmuted uh, Alexander, Alistair Alexander, maybe he has another question. I know, I mean, that, that was a, a really good answer to the question I asked and it was, was pretty much exactly it. I mean, there is so much um, uh, processing power being devoted to, to, to machine learning and it's increasing. And for example, there are things like, you know, I, I know from, from, from my own work looking into deep fakes, for example, which is something completely superfluous for most things, but hugely processor intensive. And these kinds of processes are becoming more apparent. So is, is there not just a risk that um, AI is as much a threat to climate change as it, in as much as a solution? Okay, now I also unmuted Samuel Cobb. Maybe you want to ask a question? Hello, um, I'm not sure if I want to ask a question, but I have rather a comment or maybe you can put, give some input into that. And that is if we reduce energy costs um, for, for any kind of energy system, then there's always um, not really the guarantee that there's overall a, a general decrease in emissions because it might give an incentive to simply build more energy systems and to to have more profit, if you understand what I mean with that. Does anyone want to say something about this comment? Referring to the rebound effect, um, essentially, if you make a system more efficient, then you have more use of the system, and therefore the energy use goes up as well. Um, that's absolutely right, and that's uh, a a fact that appears often if you have increased efficiency and um, the, it's of different magnitudes. So it depends on the systems and on the behavior of, of the people involved in the system. Um, yeah, it's something to, to always measure, to always keep an eye on. Um, it's not a reason to not um, increase efficiency. Sure, I, I meant mainly that it will be more effective if it's in combinations with policies that also part, put a cost on emissions so that it doesn't bounce up again. Yeah. So there was another question from uh, Safna Lutra. I couldn't unmute her, I don't know why. And uh, she asked about some of the tools that are 
uh, already available. Maybe Lynn, um, you have an answer. Ah, is it working now? Okay. Yeah, it's working. Uh, yeah, hi there. Um, as I understand, yes, we do uh, have a big data there and we need to do normalization first and then we can have some output out of that. Uh, like we do use uh, Power BI for some visualization of the data and then we can do statistical and analytics over that. So are there any tools that we can use or available in the market for um, specifically made for climate to study climate or we need to go by these uh, AI tools only? So by study climate, you mean um, climate science? No, yeah. I, I'm not an expert in climate science. I personally work in the energy system. If any of the other speakers want to talk to that. Uh, if I could uh, explain my question more clearly, I just want to understand uh, like uh, how uh, you create an AI model, but what are the bases that, what are the tools that you use for that? Like, are you using, uh, uh, like uh, for data visualization, there's Power BI in the market. So is it like you are using Power BI for your analysis or what sort of tools that you are using for your analysis purposes? Depending on the tasks, it's typically, um, I'm using Python-based um, libraries. All right. um, so I adapt to the problem. Sims, do you want to talk about what DeepMind is using? Similar. All right, thank you so much. Okay, there was also a question from Alicia Lopez. I don't know if you can unmute yourself. Alicia? Uh, I would like to, to ask uh, you, if there is a possibility to to extract energy uh, from the sea, I don't know if this, this is possible. Thank you very much. Does anyone wants to answer if this is possible? <laughs> I mean, there is tidal power. There are um, tidal power plants that leverage um, both flows and, and um, tidal energy. But um, as far as I know, I'm not sure if they are past the pilot stage at this point. So not, not widely used for sure. And we got a really big question from Martin Hedberg, who is asking if AI can change the values of our whole system. Maybe you want to speak, Martin? Uh, sure, I can do that. Um, as I said, well, energy efficiency, et cetera, it's, it's a great thing. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Donella Meadows and her work uh, on leverage points of how to intervene in a system and where she says that uh, dealing with uh, energy efficiencies, for instance, it doesn't really change the system. It's a good thing, yeah, but uh, as uh, Victor Galas uh, mentioned in, the, in his talk, we, we need system change, actually. And in that sense, you want to go higher up on the level and, and you want to change, for instance, the incentives or, or uh, the capacity to self-organize or, or change the rules of the system or preferably the values and, and the goals of the system. And in that sense, in, in mimicking the human intellect, where, which is actually addressing those things as values and goals of the system, uh, I find it very interesting if we can use AI or machine learning or things like that um, in, with that sort of in mind, not just doing what we're doing more efficiently, but actually working on changing the system uh, in a profound way. And I would address higher up on, on that lever, but that's, I mean, there, there's lots of different things, as I said. Can I jump into that? I, I think Martin is getting into something very important. And, and I think uh, uh, it gets to something that, that was mentioned that if we act collectively and if we use the power, I think we need to unpack the we a little bit. And I think that big tech 
big tech companies have a huge responsibility to act and to contribute to positive system change. And I, th I think we've seen a couple of carbon or climate commitments from big tech companies, uh, which I welcome. I think those are good. Uh, I think it's good that, that we see that big tech has a big influence and, and, uh, and could do more. I think in, in terms of using their influence in, in a positive way, I think for a start, I think uh, it would be good if they pair, paid their fair share of taxes in a different way to help boost the green economy and to help us adapt to climate change. I think that, that's a good start. Uh, and and use, use the tech in a way that, that drives innovation from the bottom up. So, so think about, and, and that to me would be one way to get what you're getting at, Mark, in the, the system change aspects. There's a big gap at the moment. You can see it as an innovation gap though, between applications of AI and the scope of the climate challenge, which is so much bigger. And we need to bridge that gap. And then you need to add biodiver loss of biodiversity and all the oh, other yeah. things okay. as well. But I've, I'm, I'm thinking of how we can use AI to maybe we have to understand ourselves better or understand the system better in order to persuade ourselves of doing things differently. Um, Martin, if, we, if I could jump into your question here as well. Um, I think that the point you make of changing the system is, is a really interesting one. And this is why we work with domain experts so often and the scientists and engineers and, and other various experts who are really uh, building these systems and responsible for running them because while our expertise might be AI, um, their expertise is, is the domain and we mm -hmm. really need to re um, rely on their, their knowledge um, in the way we build our applications. Um, I would also say that a part of this is, is that we really need to center the voices of those that are most affected by this technology that we're that we're all working to build. You know, public engagement on ethics and responsible AI can be really valuable. And at DeepMind, we've learned a huge amount from citizens, juries, and surveys, um, just really trying to help us build a deeper understanding of the way algorithmic technology is is a, is shaping people's lives. Um, and I think that that is really important to keep front of mind as well um, in this bigger conversation um, around the, the system and what we're building. Thank you. There's one last question from Gregor Braun. I hope I pronounced it right uh, about ethics and AI. Maybe it's also a wide open question. Gregor, can you unmute yourself? Of at the beginning of this session, I just uh, what I thought is um, the question: Does AI have to be able to do um, ethically correct decisions? Um, for example, if you want that uh, um, for for points of, of climate change, um, is it really the task of an AI to um, evaluate its own solutions against um, ethics? Or should this be a framework surrounding this AI to, to do so? Or should it even be a human decision to evaluate uh, AI decisions? That's kind of the question, yeah. Victor, do you want to answer? Yes, so briefly, just to allow the others to, to compliment. I think there, that's a great question. I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges for any uh, person interested in the, in the political dimensions of technology. But I, my short answer would be, uh, I think companies, tech companies, AI companies have a responsibility and the tools to make sure that they're, the tool they're using uh, is transparent, that, that it, it responds to this thought about responsible AI. Uh, I think you can, you can put that, those sort of demands on, on companies, but in the end, it's going to be on, on society to decide what technologies do we want to, to, to spread in society. And that's just very easy through law, through investments, et cetera, like we've seen in the energy sector, for example, for renewable, renewable energy. So it's not just about tech solutions and how you develop that, but also which ones do we as a society want to uh, make sure upscale or side scale. 
I'll jump in as well and say um, at DeepMind, you know, we have teams working on technical safety, ethics, public engagement, um, all in an attempt to try to ensure that we're constantly anticipating um, not only short term, but possible long term risks um, and exploring ways to prevent them from happening and finding ways to address them um, if they do. You know, we consider all of this, um, you know, the, the conversation around ethics and safety and responsible deployment of this technology. Um, what I would also underscore too is just collaboration. Um, I, I really can't emphasize that enough. You know, we're a founding member of the partnership on AI. So um, this is a, a, a really coalition of technologists, uh, academia, civil society, who are all focused on uh, developing AI best practices advancing the public understanding and building a platform for open discussion about AI and its impacts. So I think forums like that are a really wonderful opportunity to make sure that this is a collective responsibility and that all voices are included um, and that you know, the topic of ethics and responsibility is, is comprehensive to include you know, safety and, and, and all of those, those other nuanced kind of subtopics as well. Maybe to briefly add to that, I mean, those are all really important considerations. Maybe one thing to say that um, fairness is an issue that um, it's maybe also more inherent to AI because these models are often not very interpretable and um, they can also mask biases um, by, by be seemingly objective, but then performing worse, for example, on certain groups of the population that's anal analyzed and um, so being aware of these uh, fallbacks of ML and, and working actively to, to reduce biases in the model, to make them more transparent um, is something that, that needs to happen and, and is also happening in the AI community a lot. Um, so there's, there's this challenge of enabling the decision makers to in the end also um, take care of making these um, ethical decisions. So I think there's like this added layer to machine learning um, that makes it a bit challenging and absolutely agree um, with the other speakers said that political decisions and ethical decisions are up to the people. And um, we need to create models that enable people to decide. Thank you very much. I think we have come to an end and I want to thank Lynn, Sims and Victor as well as Martin and all of you, the whole audience. And I would like to draw your attention to the upcoming couch lessons about AI and creativity, AI and ethics, AI and the future of work. And next time we will speak about artificial intelligence and creativity with one artist, one designer and a professor in mathematics. So please join us again next Wednesday. Uh, tell your friends, spread the word, and share the event with your followers. You can find more information also on our website. Wait a sec. Uh, it's uh, goethe.de slash couch lessons, and there you can also find uh, the recorded events from all the, the uh, last uh, couch lessons. And yeah, I hope you will see each other again. <laughs>